All right, and I believe we are live, but hold on a second. I'm just going to make you the host. All right, Abdullah, you are now the host. Um, hopefully from there, you can share your screen. And I'm just going to do a little introduction revealed to Muhammad Ibn Abdullah in 610 CE, whilst he was in retreat at the cave of Hira, located outside the city of Mecca, was the Quran, which is the starting point for all things Islamic and stands as the supreme authority by which Muslims all over the world are guided. With the Quran playing such an important role in the lives of so many, and for whom it provides an abundance of meaning, trying to figure out the best method of unlocking the intended meaning has been an ongoing discussion and exercise since its inception. One of the most salient features of the Quran is its intertextuality and the polysemous nature of its Arabic language, which have been observed by many scholars past and present. And presently here with us today on Real Talk with Tehran Pool, we have Dr. Abdullah Galadari in conversation about his thought-provoking book titled Quranic Hermeneutics. Uh, I have it right here and I do recommend uh, grabbing it off Amazon and I will leave uh, links in the description. His thought-provoking book titled Quranic Hermeneutics Between Science, History, and the Bible, where the book's main focus is on intertextual polysemy within the Quran and in relation with the Bible. Just a little bit about Abdullah, and you can find this on his bio online. He is insane, but thankfully, he does not suffer from his insanity because he enjoys every moment of it. Similarly, he enjoys what he does for a living and is so passionate about it that for him, it's almost like he never works a day in his life. But Abdullah is currently assistant professor at Khalifa University in the UAE in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. His research focuses on Quranic studies and hermeneutics, especially in the intertextuality between the Quran and biblical literature, as well as comparative theology, comparative religion, and the intersection be between science and religion. Abdullah also has an interestingly unique story concerning his journey to Quranic, uh, Quranic and Islamic studies, upon which I hope to kick off this conversation. Salam alaikum, Abdullah. Thank you for joining uh, me to discuss your book and Quranic hermeneutics and intellectual, uh, intertextual polysemy. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tehran, for, for um, inviting me to this. Oh, yeah, no problem. The pleasure is all mine. And just to start, you started off as an engineer, but eventually made your way into Islamic studies. How did that happen? Well, uh, it, it, it's an interesting uh, thing. Well, I always was fascinated with uh, religious studies and Islamic studies ever since I was very young, really. And I was always uh, reading books and uh, about Islamic studies and also other religions as well. Uh, but I, I was very passionate with mathematics and things like that. I was also very passionate with astronomy. And that is why when I did my uh, degrees initially, I did it in engineering and applied math and so forth. And I also worked in the industry. I worked in the engineering industry. And at the same time, I was uh, teaching as well uh, at a college uh, engineering. I was teaching engineering and math and so forth. Uh, but then I felt compelled uh, to do some kind of research in the humanities, in Quranic studies. But I found out that I really lacked the, uh, the tools to do so. I lacked those tools because the way that I've been always taught is to think in an engineering way and in a scientific way. But the way the humanities are is, is very different. Doing research in the humanities is quite different. And so I decided to go back to school. I went back to school to, uh, to study humanities, to study Islamic studies, uh, and uh, all the way to the PhD. And uh, this is uh, how I really ended up uh, doing it. And then it took some time also to, to actually, because I was teaching uh, engineering at the university at the time, and I was trying to search for a place where I can actually start teaching Islamic studies instead. So I wanted to really jump ships 
uh, it, it took some time to find a, uh, um, uh, a, a job actually in the humanities. It's not as easy as it is in the engineering world. Uh, but uh, alhamdulillah, eventually I was able to, uh, to secure a job in, uh, in the humanities and teaching Islamic studies. And, and that's what I currently uh, do full time. Uh, I don't, uh, of course, regret any part of my past. I, I loved it. I enjoyed it when I was doing it. I, I really loved engineering. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, uh, people just uh, feel that uh, their calling is a little bit different maybe later on in their life. And, and I guess I felt that my calling is now needs to be uh, a little bit changed um, somewhat. And, you know, your story sounds similar to another scholar I follow, Dr. Javad T. Hashemi, who um, left his medical profession for Islamic studies. Um, so I really actually think this is a good sign, seeing people who uh, are normally inclined to that, those, that type of field of work going into the humanities, um, because that's one of the things I feel is lacking just that perspective from a more technical sense. Um, because as you kind of alluded to, the humanities is a little bit more loose than um, what you might find in engineering. That is uh, right, yes. But uh, so why the Islamic studies route and not what is typically deemed a more traditional form of Islamic learning? Okay, so uh, the reason is, is because I wanted to do a more of an academic and a scholarly approach uh, towards the study of Islam and the study of the Quran. So the, the traditional Islamic madrasa, as they would sometimes call it in the Sunni world or the uh, Islamic hawza, as they would call it in the Shi'i world, for example, uh, it's very much traditional. And the approach that I try to um, bring in is quite new. And I think to, to the traditional schools, they might not actually find it uh, very uh, interesting. And so I, do, I, I don't think that uh, they would have uh, basically considered uh, my approach as something that they would sanction and would accept. And so I wanted to have this kind of freedom um, uh, when I tried to approach the Quran and approach Islamic studies. And that is why I took the, uh, like the uh, secular or Western scholarship approach uh, in doing my studies uh, so that I do have this kind of freedom when I'm doing my research. Okay. Before entering into Islamic studies, Sounds like you were pretty familiar with how Islam is understood traditionally. But once you were in the Islamic studies field, in that environment, were you taken aback um, by the scholarship concerning um, Islam and Muslims coming out of Euro-American academia? Um, if uh, you understand what, I'm, what I mean by that, just uh, compared to what you learn about Islam traditionally, and then some of the theories that are in Western academia can be a little bit mind blowing um, from what I've mind blowing for what I, from what I've heard from some Muslims uh, practicing Muslims who enter into that field that way. Yes, it's a, it's a very important thing uh, to to think about how Western scholars actually approach the Quran, and I'm happy and glad to say that they have changed lately. So in the past, perhaps a, a couple of decades or so, uh, there is a, some kind of a significant attitude and shift amongst Western scholars in their approach towards Islamic studies and Quranic studies. It's very different than how it used to be in, in the past. Like when we look in the 19th century, all the way to perhaps somewhere around um, the mid 20th century, the approach was actually very polemical against Islam. Uh, it was uh, way too polemical. Sometimes it's like uh, you would think that are these really scholars or, or are they just like uh, trying to, um, to give some kind of a, a, a comedic uh, way of, of uh, portraying Islam and, and, and so forth. And, uh, and I'm really happy that at least um, in the recent past, these um, attitudes have slightly changed. I wouldn't say it's, it's changed completely. There are still some Western scholars who perhaps are polemical. And some of them who actually 
like they, they even when they come from a, a secular university, uh, they're still polemical, but under the umbrella of, of secularism. But in reality, they do have a very polemical agenda. And, and that's a problem. And that's a problem that I do see uh, in Western scholarship. It has changed slightly, but it still exists. However, the, the other way around still also happens. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to go to even a traditional Islamic study school, because that also is polemical. Uh, if you want to use, for example, uh, the uh, like uh, trying to understand the Quran and linking it with the biblical passages and so forth, you will also find within traditional Islamic scholarship uh, some kind of polemics against that, uh, using the Bible and things like that, or trying to even think about something. So you actually find these polarities in both Western scholarship as well as within traditional Islamic scholarship. And, and that's a problem. And I do hope that uh, people let aside all of their agendas. Uh, there is no need for any agendas. I mean, if, if we are scholars, we have to be seeking the truth, whatever that truth is. And we shouldn't be afraid of it because if even from a traditional Muslim perspective, if you believe that the um, God is the truth, then you wouldn't ever be afraid of the truth. Uh, but it's only when you feel that you're doubting, well, maybe if I'm going to seek the truth, then maybe I will find out that the things I've been knowing uh, uh, all of my life is wrong, then only will people be afraid to search for the truth. But if, if you're really confident enough, then just leave up all the agendas and just search for the truth for its own sake. And, and I think that would be the best approach, whether it's from uh, Western scholars or also from traditional Muslim scholars. And, you know, I kind of have a problem with myself using the term Western scholars as if there's a certain sphere of knowledge that is, excludes other um, areas of the world. One thing that I'm starting to notice is that it's becoming more of a everybody has their hands on Muslims, Christians, atheists um, concerning Islamic studies. And I'm trying to find a new word for it because it isn't exactly, or at least it's moving away from Orientalism as we understood it in an imperial sense to a more scientific Orientalism um, and not just certain faces from certain places. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, a re I really enjoyed what you just said. Um, you didn't give too much uh, credit to Western scholarship um, and you didn't fully denigrate traditional scholarship, but they both have um, their ups and downs, definitely. Um, so intertextual po polysemy is a terminology not many people are familiar with. I asked several of my friends if they had any idea what it meant, but they were clueless as to what the term entails. So Abdullah, what is intertextual polysemy? Well, that's, let's first uh, try to define what intertextuality is and then what also polysemy is so that when you bring those uh, two terms together, it would make a better sense. So intertextuality is basically when we're looking into different texts and see if there are any kind of allusions between them. And uh, we usually look into those allusions if there is some kind of a shared language. Uh, such as parallel terms, parallel phraseology, parallel themes, and parallel contexts. Uh, so when, when we see this kind of shared language from one text to the other, then we can basically be able to identify that perhaps uh, that text is alluding to the prior text. So, uh, and usually, of course, uh, some people would say, what, what does that mean that maybe if we just find like one shared term, is, does that constitute as an, uh, as an illusion? No, of course, if it's just a single term, it's, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is some kind of an illusion. However, if the shared language, generally speaking, um, uh, if the shared language is rare and very distinctive, then it can give us or provide us a stronger uh, support or evidence of some kind of intertextuality. And a sh shared phrases is even stronger than individual terms. And multiple shared language is even stronger than a single shared term or phrase. And uh, um, a shared language within a similar context 
um, also suggests a stronger connection than just the uh, um, uh, shared phrases or, or uh, shared terms. So the more we be, well, the more we find different points of intertextuality amongst terms, phrases, themes, and contexts, uh, perhaps the more likely we could say that it's not possibly, we would say, oh, not completely impossible, but it is very unlikely that it was just a coincidence. So that is why we would say it's more likely that there is some kind of an intertextuality or some kind of an allusion that the text is making towards the other text. So this is in a nutshell what intertextuality is. Now, what is polysemy? Polysemy is basically when we have a word that uh, has multiple meanings, but those meanings are usually shared. And in the Semitic languages, such as the Arabic language, uh, we do see that quite significantly. Uh, there is a lot of, um, uh, much of the Arabic language, for example, um, have triliteral roots, uh, roots of three letters. And, uh, and so from those three letters, we bring up or we come up with so many different words. And many of those words, they, they sometimes seem not to have any uh, kind of uh, like relationship with one another. But in reality, if we go back to the root definitions of those roots, we do see that yes, uh, much of them actually do have something in common. They do have a relationship with one another. To give you a very simple example, um, the root kataba, uh, which is uh, to mean to write, for example, uh, from it, we have so many different uh, words in Arabic, like kitab is a book because it's something that is written. Uh, uh, and, uh, for example, katib is, is the writer, the one who writes, and so forth. But also from the same root, we see another term in Arabic, which is known as katiba. And katiba means an army battalion. Now, what does an army battalion have anything to do with, with writing? Well, of course, um, anybody who would think about it would say, well, it doesn't seem, it's very unlikely that there's any kind of relationship uh, between them. But if we do actually search deep into the uh, root meanings and the etymology of the root kataba, we do realize that the root meaning actually is to put things in order. And so writing came to, to use the same root is because when you write, you're putting alphabets and you're putting words in order. Uh, and, and by extension, it came to mean a book or a writer. And the army battalion is because the army is actually placed in a specific order. Uh, it's not like completely chaotic, but you put them in a very specific order, in a very orderly fashion. And that is why in Arabic, it's using the same root which um, uh, and in which the word katiba comes from is because the army. So this is something that many people don't recognize. And that is what polysemy is. It's when you have words uh, that uh, share, a, um, share the same root, um, though they have multiple meanings, uh, but, but in reality, those meanings are related somehow with one another. So intertextual polysemy, now putting them together, is when not only are we looking for just the terms and phrases and themes and context, but also the terms themselves, we could be looking into the polysemous way how those terms are being sometimes used. Uh, so, so that is what intertextual polysemy in a nutshell uh, is. Okay. And Scott, uh, Muslim scholars of the past were aware of, I know they were aware of the intertextuality, Ibn Tamiya being one who wrote about it or spoke about it, um, but the polysemous nature of the Quran. I'm pretty sure scholars were aware that the words were as such, but was there any, has there been any extensive work in the past on um, polysemy in the Quran? Very good uh, question. Yes, actually, there has been. Um, there has been a lot of extensive work on polysemy uh, by many of the uh, um, traditional Muslim scholars in the classical times. So many books uh, usually called Al-Ashbah wa Nabar, which means the similarities um, uh, in, in the Quran. And a lot of those books do deal with polysemy and polysemous natures of, of many terms. Now, the difference that I uh, do is I actually try to 
um, look into how the polysemous nature of this term combined with the inter, um, both intra textuality within the Quran and how those um, terms are used within the Quran and also intertextuality, how those words are also used in the Hebrew Bible, for example, in the New Testament, in, in the rabbinic literature, uh, because that, um, that does open a lot of doors. You see, one of the things that we have to consider about the audience of the Quran, the audience of the Quran were, were most likely um, listening to the Quran. So it's not like they were just it's not like it was a book and they're reading from a book, but it, there was some kind of an, an oral um, a message uh, that they were listening to. And uh, w when you have this kind of an orality for the Quran and you want to tell the audience um, who you would assume have a certain kind of a background about something uh, that you want to allude to, uh, then you would perhaps try to use uh, these kinds of perhaps uh, like... Uh, uh, terms, specific terms, specific phrases that will resonate with the audience. So the audience will, will recognize, oh, so, so, um, so you're talking about this part of the Bible or this passage in the Bible or this uh, idea that we have in, in our rabbinic literature or in Jewish liturgy, for example, and so forth. So you would use these things in order to allude to them. Um, uh, um, and so that's what I try to do with intertextual polysemy. Uh, whereas in the past, they were mostly looking either into tafsir al-Quran bil-Quran, um, uh, and it wasn't always looking specifically in a, um, uh, using intertextuality, but sometimes they did, um, or using polysemy and trying to understand the polysemous natures of words in the Quran. But what I try to do is to combine those together um, so it's not as if it's something that's completely new, but uh, it's just to try to combine those methods together in order to find out perhaps what the Quran is trying to convey. Okay. And how did you first come to know about intertextual polysemy in the Quran? And uh, actually, my, my question before that, reading the Quran in English or a language other than Arabic, it won't be so obvious, will it? You would have to look and see the word in Arabic and, okay. All right, so there's something that is strictly a feature of um, reading it in Arabic, something that, but how did you come to notice it uh, in the Quran, which led you to be so fascinated uh, by it? Because I noticed you have a few articles on it. Your book is on, um, and all your lectures on YouTube um, focus on this part of Quran of the Quran. Well, that is a very um, uh, interesting question because it's a very personal question as well. Uh, it, I was just reading the Quran uh, one day and I was, as I was reading, I was saying, oh, there are certain things in here that seems to look something similar to another part of the Quran. And and I said, oh, maybe, okay, so maybe that was just coincidence. And then I continued reading the Quran. And, and again, something else showed up. Said, oh, th this also looks something very similar to another part of the Quran. And I was started to become fascinated about this. I said, okay, so maybe once it was a coincidence, twice might, might still be a coincidence. Continued reading the Quran. And the more I was reading, the more I was seeing things that for some reason, I, I, was, I wasn't even able to see it before. <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't like the first time I was reading the Quran. I've been reading the Quran ever since childhood. But then I, I realized, no, there's, there's something in there that I, I couldn't see before, and it fascinated me. And, it, and the more I looked into it, and the more I tried to say, okay, so let's see, how about somewhere else in the Quran? Is it showing any kind of, of evidence of any kind of intertextuality and so forth? And the more I looked into it, the more I did actually find it. And I said, okay, well, if, of course, if you want to make a, um, a, a certain method, you have to be systematic about it. You can't just be completely chaotic without any kind of, of methodological um, way to, to look uh, into it. So I said, well, let me try to, to make a specific kind of method and see if it would work. Um, from one part of the Quran to the other. And when I did that, I did see that, yes, it, if I do have this kind of method, it, it does work. 
And then I said, okay, well, how about we try to do this between the Quran and the Bible? So we know that now, now that I found out what, that it can work within the Quran, but how about if we do that with the Bible? And when I did that, I said, oh, it's interesting. We can actually see some kind of intertextuality is also between the Quran and the Bible when I'm trying to use this kind of method of intertextual polysemy. So I said, well, maybe what I um, just happened to uh, to bump upon um, accidentally, perhaps, <laughs> is, is something that uh, uh, that can actually work in, in a very methodological and systematic way. And, and that is how I started to, to work on it. And uh, that's what my book on Quranic hermeneutics tries, tries to show the, the method and examples of that method. But as you said, a lot of my work uh, uses that kind of method in, in order to search for uh, what I might sometimes call inner Quranic allusions, where one part of the Quran is alluding to another part of the Quran, or Quranic biblical allusions, where parts of the Quran is alluding to biblical literature, but not only biblical literature, but also like extra biblical literature, such as rabbinic literature, for example. Yeah, and you know, um, that's one thing that I found out recently, uh, the verse in the Quran that talks about um, taking a life is as if you killed the whole world and saving a life is as if you saved the whole world. That is also found in um, the Jewish Talmud. Um, so that, yeah, I found that very interesting, but uh, whereas some people might find, can call that borrowing, um, you have another theory on how, on why um, scriptures might have similarities as such. Yes, uh, actually, it's it's quite funny because uh, just yesterday I was uh, giving a lecture for uh, it was online of of course, but uh, for a university uh, um, in the Middle East, and uh, I was also um, uh, presenting about my method of intertextual polysemy, and then there was a person who was saying, well, if you're talking about that the Quran is interpreting the Bible, for example, then what difference is that from simply saying that the Quran is really just uh, dependent on the Bible and is based on the Bible? So, so how different is that from what the Orientalists used to say uh, about like the concept of borrowing and so forth? Well, the thing is uh, the Quran, if we read the Quran, um, um, and what it says about its own self. Well, we realize that the Quran never actually suggests that this is a new message. Um, many times the Quran actually says that whatever God is revealing to you is what was revealed to the previous prophets. So this is not some new message. Uh, and the Quran actually does suggest that, the, that it tries to, uh, to basically explain to the people of the book uh, um, uh, uh, about things that they did not know before. So it is not as if the Quran is completely ignoring the previous scriptures. And sometimes actually the Quran uh, actually, it like um, explicitly tells the audience to, um, to, to think about the previous scriptures, to think about the Torah, to think about the, the gospel. Like for example, it, it invokes them in one passage in the Quran where it says, um, uh, that uh, God has purchased from the believers their selves and um, their money uh, for paradise uh, or for the garden, for paradise. Um, and that is a promise that is found in the Torah, the gospel, and the Quran. So here we see a verse in the Quran that explicitly is invoking the Torah and the gospel. So one would ask like, okay, so where is that in the Torah or where is that in the gospel? Um, and we should also keep in mind that the Quran had multiple audiences. It's not only speaking to a single audience. It's not like, for example, some of the uh, books of the Hebrew Bible. Some books of the Hebrew Bible, the audience were the Israelites, um, not any further than that. Uh, but the audience of the Quran, we really have so many of them. The Quran is speaking to the non-believers of its time. It was speaking to, um, and let's not also assume that all the non-believers of its time were believing in one thing. Um, uh, there definitely were diversity. There were a diversity of beliefs uh, um, in ancient Arabia. Uh, 
So it's, so let's not assume that all the non-believers were also monolithic. They were themselves also multiple audiences amongst them. Um, the Quran sometimes uh, speaks to the believers. The Quran sometimes speaks to the Jews. Sometimes it speaks to the Christians. And even, by the way, when it speaks to the Christians, let's not assume that all of the Christian audience of the Quran were also monolithic. The Quran most likely um, uh, had an understanding of the multiple uh, churches that existed at the time with the differences in their um, Christology and their theology and so forth. Um, because in ancient Arabia, uh, there were people um, uh, who uh, actually were perhaps uh, belonged to different kinds of churches. Uh, we do know, for example, from Islamic tradition about the history of Islam, uh, that there was some kind of relationship between the ancient Arabs, for example, and the Byzantines. And so therefore, they must have known about the, the Byzantine church. They must have known about the Syriac church. They must have known about the Ethiopic church. Uh, the Muslim tradition suggests, for example, that uh, uh, some of the earliest Muslims actually uh, traveled to Abyssinia. So they must have known about the, the Ethiopic church um, uh, uh, and so forth. So, so therefore, let's not also assume that um, uh, whenever the Quran is speaking to Christians, it's, it's, it's as if it's just one single audience. We need to figure out what kind of Christians were they or what kind of Jews were they? Or even if they were the non-believers, well, what kind of non-believers were they? Because obviously they were very diverse and, and uh, therefore, the Quran had multiple audiences. And so when the Quran is actually speaking to a specific audience, you it would speak to them in a way uh, that would resonate with them. And so when you want to speak to an audience, something that would resonate with them, you would sometimes use certain kinds of allusions, um, uh, certain terms, certain phrases within a specific theme and context in which that audience will recognize um, what the Quran is trying to convey. And as I said, the Quran is not assuming that it's actually uh, the only revelation or that it's completely new. Actually, even the Quran says to its own audience of the believers that, well, if you don't know about the stories of the previous prophets, then ask the people of the remembrance. And, it, and in that context, it actually means ask the people of the book who actually know more about the stories of the Prophet. So the Quran didn't come to repeat the same stories. It's alluding to these stories to convey a message, but it's not coming to repeat the same stories as, for example, you will find in the Torah or spe specifically in the book of Genesis, for example, where you have a chronological history from the beginning of creation um, all the way to the time of Moses, for example. So, uh, so the Quran is not a book of history. It's not trying to repeat any of that history. It's alluding to it uh, because it's assuming a lot of its audience already has the background and it's saying, well, if you don't have the background, then ask the people who already have the background about it. Yeah, and it definitely makes you wonder how fast Islam spread across the Middle East, that how could it have done so if the message was so radically distinct from what everybody were familiar with? Um, and just looking at the examples you have in your book um, of um, surahs in the Quran and how they allude to a verse in the gospel, uh, makes you wonder that, okay, myself reading those verses from those surahs or reading those surahs and then reading that verse, I might not be able to see it today. But as the, at the time that it was being revealed to communities who were familiar with biblical literature and scripture, I can see how that may have rang a bell for them. Um, and that's why I found your book so interesting because I feel it taps into what may have been lost in translation over a long period of time. Uh, so going back to intertextual polysemy, is it a hermeneutical tool for interpreting the Quran or is it an exegetical tool? And are those two terms different? Because sometimes I see them being used interchangeably, but in your book, I got the feeling that there is a clear distinction. Yes, uh, of course, I mean, the word hermeneutics or exegesis uh, can be sometimes used interchangeably, and it is, as you said, used interchangeably by, um, by many. What I try to do is, uh, is to say, well, because in Quranic tradition and the Quranic exegesis, the traditional exegesis of the Quran, uh, basically, 
there are several ways in which many of the uh, past exegetes approached the Quran. Uh, one of the approaches, for example, uh, perhaps one of the prominent approaches is known as tafsir bil ma'thur. So um, um, like the exegesis based on precedent. What did the earlier people say about the uh, interpretation of this passage of the Quran? And uh, and that's like one method, but there are many methods. There are even some modern methods, like some modern Muslim scholars, for example, uh, they, they use like scientific empirical, uh, like empirical scientific method to interpret the Quran in which they would claim, for example, uh, this uh, passage in the Quran is, is uh, really uh, talking about what modern science today has, has figured out or something like that. So, so there are many different uh, uh, exegetical approaches by many uh, traditional uh, uh, Muslims, for example, throughout the history. Now, the way I, I try to do it when I'm looking into um, hermeneutics is what if, for example, we develop a, a, a new method, another method that is not fully dependent. I'm not saying that the exegetical methods, any of them is wrong, not at all. Uh, I, if I am a historian, then I do want to know the circumstances of revelation, for example, because I want to reconstruct the history. Uh, and that is one of the methods, of course, that is highly used in many of the exegetical works of the Quran, the circumstances of revelation, or as they would say in Arabic, asbab and nuzul. Uh, however, uh, if we um, if we're trying to find out, okay, if we say that the Quran is a, a historical text that is talking specifically about some event in history, then that approach would be perhaps the best approach. But if we think of the Quran perhaps not really talking um, about a specific event in history, uh, even from a theological perspective, even from a traditional Muslim theological perspective, if some Muslims would say that the Quran is for all times and all places, well, if the Quran is for all times and all places, then, then why is it that we should only confine it within a specific historical context, for example? So, so that is, of course, from a traditional Islamic perspective, but even from a secular Western perspective, for example, well, how can we even know that these were the circumstances of revelation? How, how can we um, uh, uh, trust what has been handed down um, through the Muslim traditions is actually accurate? Because sometimes, sometimes the traditions actually conflict with one another. They sometimes contradict one another. And within the same exegetical work, like you open, for example, Tafsir al-Tabari or Ibn Kathir, they will tell you, well, some people would say that uh, these circumstances of revelation was so and so. But another group of people said that the circumstances was something different. So even they knew that this is not the circumstance of revelation and only circumstance of revelation. They, they understood that there were multiple of opinions. And that is one of the things that um, a person once asked me, how, when we use this method of intertextual polysemy, how do we know we do not fall into the pitfall of tafsir bar-ra'i, which is the interpretation by personal opinion? And, and I responded to him and saying that in reality, all tafsir, including intertextual polysemy approach, all tafsir is actually tafsir bar-ra'i. It's all of them is interpretation by um, personal opinion. And, and the reason is because even if you want to accept uh, the, uh, let's say, tafsir bil ma'thur, uh, at the end of the day, you will have to choose whose opinion you're accepting. And why are you choosing this? Well, it's your own opinion. It's your opinion to choose this opinion over another opinion, for example, about how to interpret the Quran. You choose, you choose basically which exegetical work to put your more trust on. And in reality, therefore, at the end of the day, all the interpretations actually end up um, as uh, tafsir bar-ra'i, as interpretation by personal opinion, including intertextual polysemy. And that is why what I try to do, in, in, uh, as perhaps uh, you might have seen when you read the book, I try to say, well, what I'm trying to do is I'm showing you the observations of the intertextualities with those polysemous terms um, between the texts. This is what's happening. Now, why is it happening? Or um, uh, what do we end up trying to think about this is you, for you to conclude 
I'm just showing you that the texts, they don't like, that's the similarities. That's the parallelism we see in the text. Why is there those parallelism or what does it mean from a theological perspective or even a Christological perspective? That's not up to me to say. That's actually uh, something that is um, uh, entirely up to you to conclude what, what you end up with this. And I believe that's the best way to move forward, especially having interfaith dialogue um, divorcing ourselves from our theologies, which and Christologies, which you mentioned in the book, are our own creations at the end of the day. And that just looking at the text, the language, and see if what they're saying lines up minus our dogma. Um, now, you in their book, you have some really interesting examples of intertextual polysemy. I know the main one that if you were to watch your uh, lectures online, it's um, Surah um, Al-Rahman and Al-Alaq. But I thought the Moses and Al-Kidr one was really interesting as well. With, um, is it in, in Talaka? Yes. And how it comes from the same root as Talaq, um, which is the method of divorce uh, in, in the Muslim community. Um, but, you know, I would have never noticed that, that yeah, Kidder gave Moses three times, uh, and the third time they it was it was no go. Uh, how did you how did you come to that conclusion, or how did you figure out that uh, intertextuality between um, Intalaka and Tala? Well, actually, that was one of the um, earliest ones that I found by accident. I. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, as I was reading the Quran uh, initially. When I, uh, in reality, uh, if I remember the history correctly, I was reading the Quran. Um, I was doing etikaf in the mosque actually, and I was uh, it, it was during Ramadan, and uh, I was uh, I was reading the Quran. And at the time, I was at Surah Al Nahl, which is chapter sixteen of the Quran. That is when I first started saying, oh, look, there, there's a similarity in here, which is similar to somewhere else. And, and it continued on in Surah An-Nahl, and it was chapter 16. But then I continued to chapter 17 of uh, Surah Maryam. And then I went to chapter 18, Surah Al-Kahf, which I continued. And, uh, and the example of the story of Moses and the pious man, which many people uh, uh, think that it might have been Al-Khabr, uh, the story in the Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18 of the Quran, it also was like, oh, so this seems to be working, even with uh, within the Quran, for example, like the word, um, and just to, to tell the audience what, what uh, the relationship is, is um, uh, Moses and the pious man, they travel into three separate trips. And according to the narrative in the Quran, at the beginning of each trip, the Quran uses the term fantalaqa, which means, and they proceeded. That's what it literally means, and they proceeded. And then we realize that after the third trip, they completely separated ways and, and they no longer reconciled with one another. And then I realized, well, in the Quran, when it talks about divorce, which also shares the root talaqa, just as the same root for fantalaqa, um, uh, it also says that a, um, a man and a wife can reconcile with one another, but up to the third divorce, up to the third talaq. And after the third divorce, then they're no longer allowed to reconcile unless the man um, marries a, um, uh, and divorces a different wife. So basically, uh, that's one of the things that when I was reading the Quran, it, it just happened by accident. And I was, and because it started from Surah Al Nahl, by the time I reached Surah Al Kahf, I, I started to actually become more actively looking for something like that. And, and that is why I, I tried to, to search or, or to see if, if there's something more going on um, than just the Quran, just giving us a narrative. If there's some kind of a subtle, meaning behind it. And in your first chapter, you have a very interesting theory on how these creative associations may have come about. I know you mentioned that it might be the chapter that Muslims find the most offensive, but personally, I didn't find it offensive at all. It actually turned my attention towards something that 
concerning revelation or the science behind it, I just have not even thought about. I mean, as you mentioned in your book, God, we in the Quran, it says God sends the rain. We know that there is science behind that, but similar and similarly, God sends down sends down revelation. There must be a science behind that. Uh, so how did what prompted you to start your book off with that chapter? I mean, um, was it something, a conclusion you came to after writing the book and that first chapter was at the end of the, um, you wrote the first chapter at the end of writing the book and you stuck it in the beginning because maybe, uh, you know, I, I just tried to put myself in your mindset on what you were thinking when you wrote the first chapter. Yes, actually, you are absolutely right. The first chapter was actually written in the very last. <laughs> and, and the reason is because as I was trying to present the method of intertextual polysemy to many of my colleagues who were giving me uh, lots of excellent feedback, uh, one of the most important questions that, uh, that they were bringing up why is the Quran even um, like a puzzle? Like they're telling me, if, well, if you the way that the method you're using of intertextual polysemy is like you're trying to, it's like a puzzle that you're trying to put together. So why is the Quran even written in such a puzzle um, that you would want to put together? And so that basically uh, got me thinking. Right, like why would the Quran want to, to be like that? What's the reason? And I found that perhaps from a scientific perspective, when we look into the neuropsychology of how the mind works and how the brain works, then, then maybe once we understand that, once we try to understand as sometimes in, liter in literature, they would call the authorial intent, which is actually what you're just doing with me. Um, you're, you're trying to find the author, my authorial intent on how I put the first chapter. <laughs> so yeah, I'm um, trying to frame the question that way. <laughs> yes. So I'm trying to find like, so basically when we want to find, okay, what is the intent of the author of the Quran? Whoever, of course, the author of the Quran, if you think of it to be God, or if you think about it, of, um, if, if the prophet had uh, some kind of an agency towards it or anything like that. But regardless, what is the author's intent by making this puzzle? And so from what I found that from a neuropsychological perspective, that the thing, if we think about, if a person had what we might sometimes call low latent inhibition, then people with low latent inhibition, they will be able to see things that, and the relationship between things that other people typically don't have. Now, what is actually low latent inhibition? Uh, well, latent inhibition, generally speaking, is usually when you teach your mind something, like if you have a specific thing and, and you teach your mind something, that's it. Your mind associates it with that thing and, and never needs to associate, associate it with anything else. That's it. Um, this association is made full stop. Um, uh, and, and that's typical to any mind to, do, to have something like that. However, uh, uh, people with low latent inhibition in which perhaps they reach certain kind of an altered state of consciousness, which causes low latent inhibition in their minds, whenever they see um, uh, a thing that they are very familiar with, but their mind still thinks about it as something that is not familiar and it can easily be reassociated with something else. Uh, so to give an example, like uh, uh, some people might have uh, watched uh, uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind, which is really a very beautiful movie. Um, uh, and uh, it's a very old movie. I think it's been now out for, what, maybe about 20 years or so. Uh, something like that. Uh, I think so. But in any case, the, the beautiful mind is really a story. It's, it's the biography of a very well-known mathematician um, uh, by the name of John Nash. And, and he was a Nobel laureate in economics. And if you watch the movie, 
uh, you will realize that when John Nash was first um, having these kind of um, altered states of consciousness, let me not, let's not even call it psychotic episodes, let's just call it altered states of consciousness, um, um, he would actually um, uh, uh, put things in relationship with one another, even though when in reality, they're not truly related with one another. Uh, and this is very typical to people with, um, with uh, schizophrenia. So people with schizophrenia, it's very typical for them to put things together that most people would think like, why, why are you making this related to that? It makes no sense. And, and that's because in their mind, to their mind, it makes perfect sense to, to make these kinds of relationships that others don't see because of the low latent inhibition in their minds. Now, of course, if you have an individual who has low latent inhibition, but above average intelligence, then they can act as their own filter. Um, uh, uh, because again, low latent inhibition is when the brain is no longer filtering out many of these relationships that's going on. But a person who has above average intelligence and low latent inhibition, they can act um, um, uh, as their own filter. Whenever they will see things that are not related with one another and that making these kinds of relationships makes absolutely no sense, they will filter it out. Even if their brain is no longer able to filter it out, um, but their intelligence is able to filter it out and say, no, this relationship makes no sense ignore it. But um, their mind, because of their above average intelligence, they could be basically be seeing relationships um, and say, oh, this relationship perhaps makes sense. And, and this is what causes creativity. And, and John Nash perhaps is, is one of the individuals who, who perhaps had low latent inhibition and perhaps that's one of the reasons he was highly creative. Uh, because he was highly intelligent and was able to, to be very creative because his mind was able to see things that other people um, weren't able to see, but he was so intelligent that he was able to find uh, wonderful and excellent um, relationships uh, between them. And so uh, basically um, uh, a person who has low latent inhibition, but highly intelligent, very, very intelligent, they become very, very creative. And so to them, when they make these relationships, to them, it's very natural. Oh, I, I can see it. And, and so why don't you see it? Why don't you see what I see? And actually, when we read the Quran, we do see many times in the Quran, what appears some kind of a frustration. Like the, sometimes, uh, the, the, like, like God says to the prophet, for example, and in the Quran, well, um, don't be frustrated. Uh, don't be frustrated. Why? Because sometimes God puts veils in people's hearts that they wouldn't understand the Quran. Maybe those veils is this latent inhibition. I have no idea. <laughs> but, but you see, to, to the Prophet, when, even if he was passively receiving the Quran, to him, he completely understood it. Yeah, it makes sense. It's not jumbled up. It makes perfect sense to him. It's very natural to him. Um, uh, but to the other people, they, they didn't see what he saw. So whether he was the, an agent in the Quran or even if he was passively receiving the Quran, um, it, perhaps what was happening in his mind is that he did have some kind of low latent inhibition. Um, however, he was perhaps very highly intelligent. And so to him, all of those relationships made perfect sense. And he was very frustrated why the other people didn't understand what he was trying to say. And so maybe simply said, well, you know, maybe those people have veils in their hearts that even when it's right in front of your face, they wouldn't even be able to see it. Yeah, one of those creative associations that I um, would like for you to share with this is, um, yeah, what, as I mentioned, Surah Al-Rahman and Surah Al-Ala um, and how they intertextualize with, if that's a word, intertextualize with um, the Gospel of John. Uh, yes, so let's let me actually uh, share with everybody the uh, passage in question. So Surat Al-Alaq and Surat Al-Rahman. 
So let's let me share my screen here. Okay, so I hope uh, you're able to uh, see my screen. So the first Quranic revelation that is uh, usually assumed by many Muslim traditions is Surat Al-Alaq, which is uh, chapter 96 of the Quran. And it simply starts with um, recite in the name of your Lord who created, اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق, um, um, who created um, the human from the clinging, خلق الإنسان من علق. Uh, and then um, uh, recite, and your Lord is the most bountiful, um, Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram, um, uh, who uh, taught by the pen, or the use of the pen, um, uh, uh, bil -qalam, and then who taught the human that which he knew not, um, uh, ma lam -yalam. So typically, this is uh, what uh, many Muslim traditions consider uh, the uh, first revelation, or perhaps, uh, at least to some traditions, one of the first uh, revelations of the Quran. Now, the question would be this. What is Surah Al-Alaq in its beginning, in the beginning of the chapter? What is it trying to convey? What is it trying to say? Well, it's talking about Iqra, in which the word Quran comes from. So it's talking about teaching the Quran and teaching uh, the human what uh, the human did not know before. But then, I mean, the namesake of the chapter, Al-Alaq, which is the clinging, uh, what is it all about? Why is the first um, um, revelation, the assumed first revelation of the Quran, actually talking about the alaq. Okay, if it's talking about the creation of the human being, why did it not use, for example, um, the word for like uh, a nutfa or sperm, or uh, maybe turab, dust, uh, or anything else? Like why did it say specifically uh, created the human from the alaq, from the clinging, in which the whole chapter, um, chapter uh, name uh, came from that word, from that term? So this is a very interesting thing because many people, when you uh, read the, uh, uh, of course, the books of exegesis, they will always tell you that the alaq or the clinging is the clinging of the fetus in the mother's womb. And that's it. I mean, okay, so we know what the clinging is, but we don't know why this is used in the first Quranic revelation. But if we try to compare this with the beginning of Surah Ar-Rahman. So the beginning of Surah Ar-Rahman starts with Ar-Rahman, or the most gracious, one of the names of God, Allam uh, al-Qur'an, um, who taught the Qur'an, Khalaq al-Insan, who created the human, Allamahu al-Bayan, who um, taught, um, um, taught the human explanation or speech or intelligence, however you like to uh, uh, translate the word bayan as explanation. So if we now try to compare those beginning of those two chapters with each other, well, Surah Al-Alaq starts by saying, recite in the name of your Lord. And Surah Al-Rahman starts with the name of God, one of the names of God, Ar-Rahman. Uh, also, um, Surah Al-Alaq uses the word Iqra, in which the name for the Qur'an also comes from. And it's really talking, if it was perhaps one of the first revelations of the Qur'an, then it is speaking about God teaching the Qur'an, really, um, and, and reciting the Qur'an and teaching the Qur'an. And in Surah Al-Rahman, we also see this parallelism in which um, uh, Al-Rahman, or uh, the name, one of the names of God, is the one who teaches the Quran. In Surah Al-Alaq, we also see that God created the human being. Um, and when we compare that with Surah Al-Rahman, it also talks about God um, creating the human being. And in Surah Al-Alaq, it talks about uh, God teaching um, uh, the, uh, the use of the pen and uh, teaching the human that what they did not know before. And in Surah Al-Rahman, it also talks about that God teaches al-bayan, or the explanation of things, or in other words, things that people did not know before. So when we compare those with one another, 
we do see from a literary perspective, there's a lot in common. There's lots of parallelism between them. Um, uh, uh, so why is there this parallelism? So we can say maybe this parallelism is now obvious. Now that I showed you the parallelism, now you could say that this parallelism is obvious. But why is this parallelism even there? I mean, if Surat Al-Alaq was revealed before Surat Al-Rahman or Surat Al-Rahman was revealed before, it doesn't matter. One of them is alluding to the other. Why is one alluding to the other? Because here we see the intertextuality where we could see one is alluding to the other. But why is there this kind of allusion, an inner Quranic allusion, for example? What is it trying to convey? Well, if we think about it, well, what is the clinging again? Well, to the um, most exegete, it's the clinging of the fetus in the mother's womb. Well, let's start using now. Now we see the intertextuality. Let's, let's use the polysemy uh, as well, not just the intertextuality on its own, but also the polysemous nature of the whole thing. Well, in reality, the, the word for a mother's womb in Arabic is actually um, called rahim. And it shares the same root as ar-Rahman, which is one of the names of God in which Surah Ar-Rahman starts with. So perhaps, and again, perhaps, and, and as you will realize throughout all of my book, I always use maybe, perhaps, possibly, because at the end of the day, we, I mean, uh, we don't know. We, 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 we can't go back uh, in time into history and maybe ask the prophet what exactly this means or so forth. But perhaps what's going on in here the reason behind this inner Quranic allusion is because the clinging of the fetus in the mother's womb, which people have in mind in Surat Al-Alaq, is actually a metaphor for the reality. And the reality is what? Is not the clinging of the fetus in the mother's rahim or the mother's womb, but it is the clinging unto Ar-Rahman the clinging unto God. And those who cling unto God, perhaps God teaches them the Quran, or God teaches them that what they did not know before. And maybe the, um, uh, the clinging of the fetus in the mother's womb is only used as a metaphor. Actually, if we even further go into this metaphor, well, uh, we of course would say that the fetus is in the mother's womb. And the word for fetus in Arabic is called janin, which has its root in janana, which its root meaning literally means something that is hidden because you know, the, uh, the fetus is, is hidden in the mother's womb. So, so um, the fetus is in the mother's womb, al janin fi rahm al um, what we would say in Arabic. So, um, and when we compare that with Islamic concept of heaven, uh, people, uh, like Muslims would say that heaven is in God's mercy. And heaven is Jannah, which shares the same root, Jannah, as fetus. And it is in God's mercy because the word mercy shares its root with the womb. So just as the fetus is in the mother's womb, heaven is in God's mercy. But of course, the metaphor doesn't also just stop there. Well, the fetus is fed through the navel or the belly button, as some people would call it. And in Arabic, the navel is called surra, which has its root in sarara, which shares the same root as sir or asrar, which means secrets or mysteries. And the navel is in the belly, which is in the button. And the button in Arabic also shares its root with the button, um, uh, which is uh, the opposite of a vahar. A vahar is the exoteric or the outer, and al batan is the inner or the esoteric. So perhaps this metaphor is trying to show that just as a fetus clings into the mother's womb and is fed through the navel in the belly, so those who actually cling onto ar-Rahman, at-ta'alluq bil-Rahman, 
cling unto God, they are fed with knowledge of the mysteries or the asrar about the hidden or the inner knowledge or inner meanings of the Quran or of life or anything else. Or in other words, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ um, Taught the human that what the human did not know before. So perhaps that is what the clinging in Surah Al-Alaq really um, uh, is trying to convey. That's the reason, that's why. And and if we think about it, that it is perhaps um, the first Quranic revelation, then it might also be giving us or telling us how the Quran was revealed. Well, how was the Quran revealed? Well, maybe it is when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam, so when Muhammad clung unto God, and then the revelation came to, to him. And Muhammad received knowledge that he did not know before, that he received the knowledge of the Quran that he did not know before, because Muhammad clung unto God. So maybe that is what it's also trying to say in, in a, a different perspective. And when we compare now this message of the Quran with the Bible, if we look into the Gospel of John in chapter three of the Gospel of John, uh, let me actually show to you here. So in chapter three of the Gospel of John, we have the story of a man by, uh, named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus um, uh, at night. And uh, Jesus tells him that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again, or sometimes translated as born from above. And Nicodemus, of course, what do you mean? Like said, like, well, what do you mean? Uh, can a man return back to his mother's womb in order to be born again. And then um, Jesus responds again, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. And so here Jesus was trying to um, uh, separate or to divide two different um, uh, types of birth. Um, he said, uh, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So there is a physical birth, but there is a spiritual birth. And now when we look at that and see how um, uh, Surah Al-Alaq and Surah Al-Rahman compare with one another, perhaps that's what it is. There is the physical birth, but the physical birth is only a metaphor for the spiritual birth. But of course, when you want to give a spiritual message to somebody, you can only give it to them in a way that they would understand. So, uh, so you would use metaphors, for example, you would use similes, for example. And, and so perhaps the Quran is trying to talk about spiritual birth and is using uh, physical birth as a metaphor for this kind of a spiritual birth. And perhaps uh, that is um, what the, the Quran is trying to convey. And when we compare it with the gospel, for example, we can see that perhaps both of them have a very similar message um, uh, to them. So um, there is another thing, by the way, according to Muslim tradition, uh, one of the uh, hadith of the Prophet, the sayings of the Prophet, is that Surah Ar-Rahman is called Arus Al-Qur'an, or the Bride of the Qur'an. Why is it called the Bride of the Qur'an? Well, maybe it is because it is explaining the womb in which a person is born from. Um, the spiritual womb, if you like. So perhaps, perhaps that's why it's called the Bride of the Qur'an. But anyways, as I said, all tafsir is tafsir bar ra'i or uh, tafsir by opinion, exegesis by opinion. But what we do know is at least if we uh, look into them, at least we know that the intertextuality is there. But why it is there? What message is trying to convey? Well, I'm only showing you observations and maybe it's completely up to you on what to conclude from it. So uh, I hope that makes sense. Oh, it's amazing. It definitely makes sense. And that's, uh, that example is what grabbed me. I think I even posted it, not I think, but I did post um, a quotes concerning that example from your book on, on my Facebook. And I think I told a few people because I was just so um, mind blown on the similarity, the intertextuality between the two surahs and then the, or the intertextuality between the two surahs and then the intertextuality with the Gospel of John. Um, and which goes to my next question. Um, the Quran has 
an interesting, well, actually, I wanted to touch on this before we got too far away from hermeneutics and exegesis. The Quran has its own method of exegesis that you mentioned in your book that isn't exactly like Azbab al-Nazul or Bill Mathur. Um, it involves one, depending on God, like what you just mentioned uh, in uh, your the examples of Surah al and Surah Al-Rahman, and also knowing the Arabic language. Yes, you're right. And, and that's one of the th reasons you asked me earlier in this interview why I didn't go to a traditional school, um, a traditional Islamic school to, to get um, a traditional Islamic uh, uh, kind of, uh, of learning. And because typically when you ask how one needs to or um, what are the qualifications for one to be qualified to to interpret the Quran so what kind of uh, qualifications one needs to have and then they would tell you well you a person needs to be competent in understanding the Quran the uh, sayings of the prophet or the hadith the Arabic language and grammar uh, logic theology rational reasoning um, uh, knowing the circumstances of revelation, the abrogating and abrogated uh, verses, uh, which is Nasakh and Mansukh, the general and uh, specific verses, the comprehensive and explicit verses, the clear and the vague or the muhkam and mutashabah. They need to know about the hadith sciences, which includes the chain of narrations, the content. They need to also know um, sources from um, based on other um, uh, um, uh, pl places, like the consensus uh, of scholars, which is known as ijma or particularization and restriction or taqsis, taqid, as, as they are called in Arabic, for rulings and the proper methods of extracting rulings from the evidence and so forth. So in reality, when you ask, um, the qualifications, uh, how, how can you start even interpret to interpret the Quran and, or, or the qualifications to do that? You're given a set of rules and, and, and things and regulations to, to think about. But is any of those actually based on the Quran? Does the Quran tell us that you actually need to know all of these different things? Does it tell us you need to know about the hadith, about the chains of narration and it, no, I mean, did the prophet even say that? Of course not, because the chains of narration came much away many times later after the prophet. So, <laughs> so, so it's it's not based on the Quran, not even based on the sayings of the prophet himself. Hmm. Does it mean that it is wrong? No, I mean, earlier mujtahids, as we would say, so earlier Muslim scholars said you need to have these qualifications. And so a lot of people today who are doing ijtihad, if you like, um, who are um, trying to become scholars and, and try to, um, uh, uh, to find out meanings and so forth, uh, they actually um, think that they're doing ijtihad. But what I really call it, I call it a, really a paradox, because in reality, they're not doing ijtihad. They're doing taqlid al-ijtihad, which means they're imitating the method of ijtihad that was put by mujtahids in the past. So they're only doing imitation of the ijtihad. They're not really doing pure ijtihad. So what does the Quran really say about how to interpret the Quran? And as you said, how to interpret the Quran? rahman It's to cling unto ar-Rahman. That is how God teaches the Quran. So in reality, that is the, 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 the way to teach, um, to, to learn the Quran and to interpret the Quran or to understand the Quran. And many people sometimes ask me, uh, many Muslims um, ask me, uh, like, uh, yeah, but I mean, like, uh, how do we, uh, like, uh, ask God for, for the interpretation of the Quran? And, and, and because I always tell them, like, uh, just ask God for the interpretation. They always ask, like, like, how can God, we ask God and how can God respond to us? And I usually tell them, well, if you read a book and there is a paragraph in that book that you don't fully understand, then uh, what do you do? How do you find out the, um, uh, like what the author intended in that paragraph? Now, of course, if the author was alive and you have easy access to the author, um, you can ask the author directly. Oh, what did you mean by this paragraph you wrote in this book? And then the author will tell you what, what, uh, what the author meant by it. Uh, if the author was dead, 
then like maybe you were reading Shakespeare, for example, and, 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 and the author is no longer with us and you're not sure about what the author meant by a specific uh, paragraph uh, um, uh, in their book, then maybe you can ask, I don't know, professors of English literature who, who really um, delved into the works of that author and, and, and all of their literary works. And, and so perhaps they can try to figure out what might the author have meant by this. And so then I ask usually um, many of my Muslim friends, I tell them, uh, the author of the Quran, is the author dead? And uh, they tell me, no, the author is very much alive. And then I tell them, well, then ask the author. Why are you asking me? Or why do you ask anybody else, like a certain sheikh or a certain... Don't ask anybody, just ask the author. But then they tell me, but how can the author speak to us? So how can God speak to us and tell us the, um, and tell us the, uh, uh, the meaning of the, of the Quran or the interpretation of what, what is meant in, in the Quran? And, uh, and then I tell them, it's very funny that you ask this question, because according to the Quran, it gives us a very interesting story of Abraham. When Abraham uh, basically uh, destroyed the idols of his people, except for the big one, and his people came to him and asked him, like, uh, did you break all the, our idols? And, and Abraham responded and replied, no, he said, uh, Ask, ask the big one and, and, and ask them if they were to respond to you. And then the Quran tells us when it continues with the story, it tells us how those, the people of Abraham realized that those idols don't speak. And, and they return back to Abraham and tell Abraham, well, um, you know that our idols don't speak. So why are you asking us to, to ask them? And then Abraham tells them, and then, so why do you follow um, uh, those who, who really cannot even speak? So what does that really mean? It means Abraham's God is not someone who is speechless. That's what it might mean, because, because it's as if the story is showing us that Abraham is making fun of his people because his people are worshiping gods that don't speak, which therefore must mean um, uh, uh, that Abraham's God is not speechless. So how can someone like a, a, a Muslim, for example, would tell me, uh, well, how can God speak to us and tell us, well, well, how can you follow a God who doesn't speak according to the Quran? So if you're following a God who doesn't speak, then according to the Quran, that might be a false God. So, so I, that's what I would say. It's uh, the, the, the way that the Quran really tells us uh, to find its meanings is really God who explains to us, or God is the one who teaches the Quran. Now, of course, as you said, the Arabic language, yes, the Quran does emphasize its own language, um, uh, uh, the language that it was revealed in uh, many times. Uh, for example, in one of the times it says that, uh, in a couple of times it says like this, uh, that God has revealed the Quran in Arabic so that you might understand. And actually the word uh, used in the Quran for understanding is the word ta'qilun, which has its root in aqala. And the root aqala actually means to tie things together and to connect things with one another. And that is why it is used to mean aql in Arabic, which means the, the mind or understanding, because the mind, in order to understand things, it connects things with one another in order to make an understanding of it. Uh, and so maybe, uh, when it says uh, is, is not only that you might understand, but maybe that you might connect things with one another, to tie things with one another. And I'm not saying that this necessarily sanctions intertextual polysemy, but perhaps it's something to consider. But in reality, at the end of the day, it is Ar-Rahman, it is God who teaches the Quran. And the way for that to happen is perhaps, as Surat Al-Alaq says, you need to cling on to God. Beautiful. Two more things before we conclude this interview. And I am definitely appreciative of you doing this for me. Um, this has been phenomenal, in my opinion. But I have to ask you about uh, Ibn Allah um, in relation to Ezra. That's probably the only example that I thought 
I, I saw where you were going with it, but still in my mind, maybe kind of a bit of a stretch, but I still see, I still see a lot of, I, I see where you were going with it, but I wanted you to kind of explain it further for me. Maybe I didn't understand properly from reading and you can explain it um, a lot better than how I understood it reading. Well, thank you. Thank you for this question. And I do agree, of course, not when we're using intertextual polysemy, not all of the examples that we would end up with will have the same equal strength as one another. So uh, some will have stronger evidence, uh, others will have uh, less uh, um, uh, or weaker evidence. And, and definitely, and as I said, when I, I try to explain intertextuality, Intertextuality is really uh, uh, looking into shared language, but uh, we have to take into consideration, of course, parallel terms, parallel phrases, parallel themes, parallel contexts, and that uh, if it was just a single term, even though it's perhaps uh, um, uh, rarely used, it's not as strong as, for example, if you find another intertextual example where there is um, uh, shared, not just word terms, but also shared phrases and perhaps also shared context, uh, shared theme and so forth. So yes, uh, not all of the um, examples you will end up will have um, um, equal uh, footing, if you like, uh, or some of them will be stronger than others, others will be weaker than others. Now, on the passage in question about uh, Uzairun ibn Allah, or Ezra, um, the ibn Allah, the son of God, as it is typically understood. Now, interestingly, in all of the Quran, whenever basically... Uh, 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 it talks about, for example, Jesus is not begotten of God. It uses the word walad. It uh, doesn't really use the word ibn uh, for Jesus. The only time it does is actually in this passage in question, where it says that um, uh, the Jews say that Ezra is ibn Allah, and the Christians say that the Messiah is ibn Allah. Um, and then it says that's a saying with their mouths. But if we think about it, where did the Jews or when did the Jews ever say that Ezra is Ibn Allah, if we understand Ibn Allah as the son of God? There's no place in Jewish literature, historically speaking to the present, that ever tells us that there were anybody um, uh, who basically... Uh, uh, any Jew who believed that um, uh, Ezra is Ibn Allah. If you look in the books of Tafsir and the books of exegesis, they will tell you, well, maybe there was like one Jew or a couple of Jews or, or maybe some sect nobody has heard about. But why would the Quran say that the Jews say when it's speaking to a, 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 like a, a, a single person or a, a small group of people, uh, if it's something that is not very prominent, because immediately, I mean, the Jewish audience, the other Jewish audience of the Quran, if there was just like, you know, a couple of Jews who said that, the rest of the Jewish audience would completely say, hey, hey, wait a minute, we don't say Ezra is Ibn Allah, so what in the world are you talking about? Yeah. So they will immediately say, no, the, 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 this is not what we um, what we um, um, uh, try to say. But I actually heard that um, a couple uh, a couple weeks ago. I heard I was speaking to someone, and they were saying that yeah, your Quran tells stories or tells lies about the Jews, saying that they worship or they believe Ezra is the son of God, but that's nowhere to be found in their literature. And that's one of the reasons why I found your theory on um, Uzair or Ezra to be so intriguing because there is kind of still a mystery um, behind what is meant by Ezra ibn Allah. Where I've yes. seen what, one scholar try to equate Uzair to Osiris saying that it was its baggage from when the Israelites were in Egypt, but that isn't that convincing as well. But I do believe, uh, Uzair ibn Allah is um, a, a very good attempt. And looking at the um, lexicon of um, um, ibn or uh, the uh, transliteral root of I, uh, it's B, 
B N Y. Um, I can see, yeah, yeah, I can see how it uh, it's translated into temple. Um, and then with Ezra being the figure he was in Jewish history, uh, a part of the rebuilding of the second temple, reconstructing the Torah, um, I could see how, yeah, Ezra, the temple of God, would make uh, would make would make sense. But it sounds like it's a little bit of a play on words. Um, the Jews say Ezra is the temple of God, and Christians say that the Messiah or Jesus is the temple of God. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Sorry if I was. Just yeah, to... you're absolutely right. Of, of course. Yes. As you said, it's the root Benaya, which means to build. And when we do open the book of Ezra in the Bible, we will see it immediately many times there, the, the usage of the word even. Um, uh, um, and it means to build. Uh, it, it's asking, of course, to build the second temple, as you said. Uh, and so the whole idea of the word Ibn, because if we think about Ibn means to build, then everything in reality is Ibn Allah, because God built everything. <laughs> God built everything. So, so yes, yeah, so everybody is Ibn Allah in that sense. God built everything. But the, the thing is also about the word Ezra in Hebrew is itself polysemous. And in the second temple, uh, the word Azara, which shares the same root as the name Ezra, so Azara, is actually used for the temple court. Mm. So is it also possible, therefore, that the temple court, the Azara, that the Jews say that the temple court is Ibn Allah, the building of God or the temple of God, um, and the and the the Christians say that the Messiah is a temple of God, and of course, according to the Gospel of John, uh, we do recognize that uh, John is trying to convey a message of the Messiah being the temple of God in the body, um, in flesh. Uh, so, so yeah, for for the Christians, it's easy to to identify, but for for what the uh, the word Ezra and is it really. Um, Ezra himself, or is it Azara? But that's perhaps what the polysemy. Um, and we do see uh, several places that the Quran sometimes do, does use, play, of, play on words. And, and not only the Quran, we also see sometimes even like rabbinic literature uses play on words. Actually, even, even using the word banaya to build. Uh, like, for example, in the Talmud, it says, uh, uh, um, um, don't call them um, banayich, but call them banayich. So don't call them um, your children, but your builders. Um, and so, so even, even within a Jewish a, a context um, back and background, the, the same word is used in wordplay. So if the audience of the Quran here were some Jews, and they might even re realize that there, there could be this play on words when using even this root of banaya. But as I said, again, I mean, I just make observations. I'm not saying that this is the interpretation. Uh, if you want to know the interpretation, ask God, don't ask me. But this is just an attempt, as you said. A really good attempt, in my, in my opinion, and I thoroughly enjoyed your book. And I found it to be very thought provoking. I probably read the first chapter like three times just because um, it was just that thought provoking to me. Uh, there was more in the book that I wanted to talk about, but I know you do not have all day. I just tried to focus on the examples I found the most intriguing, but I definitely would like to know more about your interpretation of the clear verses and the not so clear verses. Um, I was reading it early this morning um, in reference to the Sharia and how maybe the spirit of the law is what's clear and the means on how we implement it is the, um, is the uh, not so clear, uh, which, is, uh, which just got me thinking about something else that me and uh, a friend of mine were having a conversation about. Um, but let's see, uh, would you like to do a Q&A if there's anyone watching? Um, I can pull up the chat real quick. And yes, absolutely. No problem. Okay, let's see. All right. And if there are any questions in the chat, feel free to, or any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I will um, put them to Abdullah. And while we wait 
Okay, where can I find his book? Uh, I found it on Amazon, and I will put a link to uh, I'll put a link to his book in the description. Um, and also, this would be a good time to talk about your upcoming book, um, if you would like to speak about that for a bit. Uh, sure, of course. Uh... Well, my upcoming book is really about uh, death and resurrection and what kind of a, a good <laughs> book to be just about death and resurrection. But you see, one of the interesting things about the Quran is that its main theme is usually really the, the day of resurrection. That's, that's like the main theme of the Quran from, from beginning to end. Uh, that's the, the main theme of the Quran. And so uh, what I did in my uh, upcoming book is I try to look into uh, many of the passages that speak of uh, death and resurrection in the Quran and see how those passages um, uh, actually also when we intertextualize them within the Quran and between the Quran and the Bible, uh, how do they actually compare and what what message are they trying to convey? And uh, so th this book is really um, using an intertextual approach with biblical and rabbinic literature to try to find uh, many passages of the Quran about death and resurrection, which many uh, traditional exegesis considered as literal death and resurrection. But I show that once we intertextualize them, uh, we will recognize that a lot of them are actually metaphorical. Uh, so many of those uh, passages that some, uh, some exegesis thought it was a very uh, literal kind of death and resurrection is actually has a, is metaphorical. It's talking about a metaphorical death and metaphorical uh, resurrection. And the Quran, by the way, many times also explicitly uses it as a metaphor. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, it sometimes explains how some non-believers, uh, as they're, they're like they're dead, and, and it explains how, uh, like when when the prophet, for example, was frustrated why the non-believers were not accepting his message. The Quran, for example, once says it's um, uh, like uh, don't uh, like don't be frustrated. How can you actually have uh, dead people in their graves listen to you? So it, it, it's using this kind of metaphor of death, for example, for non-believers and, and so forth. So sometimes it's explicit, but sometimes it's not so explicit. And the ones that it is not so explicit, a lot of the uh, exegesis simply um, take it literally. But, uh, but the book tries to go intertextualizing it between the Quran and itself, between the Quran and the Bible uh, and the rabbinic literature to see that a lot of the other verses that many uh, ex exegetes thought that the Quran is giving a very a literal uh, uh, message of death and resurrection might actually be a metaphorical one. Okay, sounds really interesting and I can't wait to grab that one as well. I actually was gonna buy it uh, when I saw it on Amazon, but um, I jumped the gun a little bit and it wasn't available. It was just, uh, yeah, I just seen the picture of it and it looked new. So I was like, okay, let me grab that one too. But then I saw that, okay, I have to wait a bit. Um, so I will be looking out for that one. Uh, but we do have two questions. So is reincarnation mentioned in the Quran? Well, what is reincarnation as a term, as an Arabic term? I mean, how would you even use the Arabic? What would you translate it into Arabic? It's very difficult, really, to figure out what the um, uh, Arabs really uh, used for the word reincarnation, if they even used the word for it, unless we go back in time and into history and, and figure that out. So... Uh, the words that we use today in Arabic for reincarnation, there are several of them that we use today, um, uh, but uh, most of them are, are medieval terms. Uh, they were not used uh, early on for reincarnation, and, and they, they were later on used in, in the medieval times, uh, mostly to translate a lot of the Greek uh, works, uh, uh, and sometimes also some of the uh, uh, Eastern uh, philosophy as well. Uh, but uh, besides that, uh, we don't really know an early usage of, of a term for reincarnation in, in, in that kind of sense. Now, did the ancient Arabs themselves, uh, did some of them believe in reincarnation? 
Actually, according to Muslim tradition, some of them might have. Uh, there is a concept known as the Raja, as they are called in, in Muslim traditions. And the Raja is a concept in which some people do return back to this life. Uh, it's a little bit different than uh, the concept of reincarnation, but let's also be frank. The concept of reincarnation is not itself monolithic. The Buddhist concept of reincarnation, for example, is very different than the Hindu concept of reincarnation. They're not the same. So, so this is the same thing also with the concept of Raja. They're, they're not like the Hindu reincarnation. They're not like the, uh, the uh, uh, Buddhist reincarnation. It's, it's a different kind of, of reincarnation, uh, if you like. Uh, but there is this idea that some ancient Arabs did believe in the concept of Raja, some form of reincarnation and so forth. Now, does the Quran explicitly speak of them or not? Well, if we look into, into the Quran, perhaps we wouldn't recognize it because we don't even know uh, what terms were used for, for that uh, and, and what were the ideas. And as I said, and many of the non-believers of that time, uh, we can't imagine that they were all believing in the same thing and, and worshipping the same thing. Even if they were not uh, believing in a monotheistic God, for example, uh, it doesn't mean that they necessarily believed in the same thing. So maybe some of them believed in, in uh, no afterlife whatsoever. Maybe some of them did believe in some form of an afterlife uh, so in some form of reincarnation or, or perhaps even some form of resurrection as well and so forth. So it's, uh, it's not really easy to, to dig deep and, and to figure it out because we don't really know what the term for reincarnation was and the different concepts that existed in ancient Arabia at the time. You know, that kind of put another question in my mind uh, looking, at, looking at some of your other articles. You have a lot um, of articles written about uh, Islam and Buddhism, which uh, I found really interesting. Not too many Muslim scholars uh, go that route when it comes to interfaith. It's usually dealing with Christians and Jews. But to see a scholar actually reach out to Buddhists and see, okay, what certain uh, concepts in the Pali canon, how they compare to what's in the Quran, um, I, I think that is a very good attempt to build some type of bridges with, uh, I guess, the Dharmic community. Because um, I do have a few Buddhist um, viewers and I shared with them um, some of your articles on uh, Buddhism and Islam. And I think they enjoyed it because uh, they were talking about it in a group chat we were in. But uh, yeah, I'm not gonna hold you up too much longer. I actually have to go to work after this. It's been a busy week. Um, I work for uh, student accommodation. So we have students uh, coming in about to start school soon. And it's been a total nightmare. Um, I'm glad that this interview went as well as it did because if you could see the behind the scenes, it was total madness. Um, and I was a bit nervous, but uh, everything came together nicely. And I thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Gulladary. I know you don't like uh, the, the doctor part, but I just had to throw it in there one time. I told you if I, if I was a doctor, I would use it to my advantage every chance I had, but um, I totally respect you for, you know, wanting to uh, just be seen as uh, a nor average. But I know how some people can put stat where with certain statuses where they place people and, I, and you probably just don't want to be viewed in that way, which I totally understand. So. Well, PhD actually stands for permanent head damage. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where the insanity came from. But uh, possibly. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much for for inviting me and for having me and for this uh, wonderful interview. I, I greatly appreciate it, and I, I I would like to thank your audience as well uh, um, for for watching, and I I very much appreciate uh, uh, the work that you really do. Oh, no, I appreciate your work. And hopefully we can have you on again for your other book. And you can share with us some more of your insights on intertextual polysemy. And you know what? I, I think I made the flyer wrong. I should have put intratext. You see, now I know intratextual and intertextual. One is within the text and one is outside the text with other texts. So um, I won't make that mistake again. I was using intertextual for, for both. <laughs> so. Well, most people actually use it for both. That's fine. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. God bless.
Thank you. Thank you. Take care and uh, have a wonderful um, time as well. A wonderful day and uh, week as also. God willing. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Oh, you got to make me host again for me to end it. <laughs>